hello and welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Maddie Whittle. I'm a member of the programming team at Film at Lincoln Center and one of the co-programmers of the FLC Free Talk series, uh, which is a year-round program that um, we really have had an adventure bringing to the virtual realm this past year. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's exciting to launch the year 2021, not knowing you know, exactly what the year is going to look like, but keeping the tradition strong. And um, thank you all for being with us, uh, specifically for the first talk of the new year. Um, just say a few quick words before we get underway. I don't wanna take up too much time, but uh, I do wanna say thank you to the FLC board patrons, members and moviegoers who make our work possible throughout the year. We are a nonprofit uh, and as such, we rely on your support by becoming a member. You, are, uh, you can join our community of film lovers, take advantage of discounts and special offers and help us to continue sharing the best in cinema, uh, both in the real world and currently in the virtual realm. Uh, so if you're not a member, please consider uh, becoming one today. Uh, thank you also to HBO, the presenting partner of Lincoln C Film at Lincoln Center Talks year round. Um, we uh, appreciate them. And uh, so without any further ado, uh, today's talk will be on the subject, well, it'll be on many subjects, but the, the sort of starting point will be Mank, uh, the uh, film directed by David Fincher that was released uh, in December on Netflix. Uh, so you can still see it on Netflix. It's uh, getting, you know, award season buzz. So it's definitely uh, on everyone's mind. And uh, we're really, 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 Delighted to have with us today the uh, Director of Photography from Mank, Eric Messerschmidt, ASC. Uh, and moderating today's conversation will be uh, J.D. Connor, Associate Professor of Cinematic Arts at the University of Southern California. Um, so I don't, I don't want to say too much, but um, I will say that this conversation should last around an hour. And in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the talk, we'll have time for some audience questions. So if you have a question, for Eric, uh, you can submit it through the Q and A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and uh, we will uh, pass it along to JD and Eric, and might come up in the conversation. Uh, so, without any further ado, uh, thank you all again. Welcome, and JD, take it away. Great, thanks so much, Matt. Um, this is a, a real thrill. Um, it's a thrill in part because uh, I'm a tremendous admirer of Eric's work. Um, it's also a thrill because I'll be teaching virtually again this spring and I'm teaching uh, a big lecture class on Netflix. So I've been thinking a lot about Netflix as a studio, as a tech company, um, as a TV company, as a movie company. And Eric has experience with all of that. Uh, but I want to start uh, by talking about um, Eric's 2020, which on the one hand, I'm sure was a lot like the rest of ours. Uh, but on the other hand, it seems to have been a huge year. Uh, this movie comes out at the end of it. Uh, my understanding is that you got married earlier in the year and got inducted into the ASC. Um, both those things, I won't ask you to rank them, but uh, can you tell me a little <laughs> bit about just sort of what that what that experience is like as somebody who's got a like a humming professional existence plus you know trying to make a life in the middle of all of that? I'm sure everybody's a little interested in a little bit of that. Sure. Yeah. I. I uh... Yeah, I had a really special 2020. I mean, it was challenging and it was, you know, there was obviously a lot of uh, a lot of horror going on in the world, you know, a lot of difficulty for a lot of people. And and um, and uh, and it, you know, it was a challenging year for the film business, of course. But but for me, um, I was fortunate. I was really fortunate. I did get married, which was amazing. And, and we got married over Zoom. Uh, which was a, was was an interesting experience, uh, but it was great. It was you know it was a fantastic wedding, and um, yeah, I mean you know the the we we did we finished the film at the beginning of the year, and um, we sort of just barely skirted under the wire of, of COVID and finished just before everything kind of locked down and it, it became real in the United States, and um, yeah, it was. Um, you know, we, we did the post throughout the lockdown. We did the post virtually on film. And, and so it was, um, yeah, it was, you know, it was, it was obviously um, a new experience, uh, you know, all the new experiences related to, to what happened in 2020 for, for me. But in particular, it was, uh, uh, there were, you know, there were absolutely 
uh, there was some positive energy being had in, in my end of the world. So I'm, I'm, I'm constantly uh, feeling thankful for that, for sure. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, while many of us had terrible 2020s, I also think that there was that sort of strange rhythm where something might go right in the middle of all of it. And it was difficult to know how to begin to react uh, to it. And um, it's always one of my, uh, one of my major concerns as a, you know, as somebody who teaches this is to try to understand what that relationship is between a personal life and a career and then sure. you know, the political world we live in. Um, let's wind back a little bit before that to talk about how uh, you came on to the project. Uh, you'd been DPing on Mindhunter. Um, do you know, can you recall when, like, you knew that this was going to happen next, uh, that you were going <laughs> to jump to the feature? You know, I, God, I, I think we were, we were finishing up Mindhunter and then we were prepping World War Z mm -hmm. and, and then the film fell apart and, and I didn't have a job and I, uh, I out of the blue got an offer to go do a Raised by Wolves, Ridley Scott series, uh, which was shooting in South Africa. And, you know, they needed someone to, to take over after, uh, really did the pilot and, um, uh, I took the job. I was really excited about it. And I went there. And then while I was there, I, I, I heard from David, he was like, Oh, we're going to do this movie. Um, and I think it'll line up when you're done with, with the show. Uh, you know, why don't you do this film? And um, I had sort of, I kind of knew peripherally what it was because I had heard him talk about it. And I knew that he was, you know, he had been working, he had been working to make this film for a long time. And um, it was something that was kind of on his radar, but I, I didn't, I hadn't read the script. I knew nothing about it really other than kind of the, just the broad scope of what it was. And then, um, and then he sent me the script and I immediately, I was like, Oh, okay. This is, this is what we're going to do. And of course I was like, you know, I was incredibly excited about it and, um, and thrilled yeah. to so, be invited. So did you know, uh, at what point did you know you were going to be working in black and white? I guess it's the, like the sort of like, Oh, it was a media. Question. He's like, oh, we're going to yeah. do, we're going to do, I, I knew we were doing it in black and white before I read the script. It, I knew what it, I, yeah. Um, it, he was like, oh, I've got this black and white movie. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And then I, you know, and then I learned more about it. So it, that was clear from the beginning. Right. Uh, so I, and it had been something he had been, you know, working towards for, I mean, since, I mean, I think he's been making, trying to make this movie for 30 years. Uh, and it was always, it was always a black and white film for him. So, um, yeah. That yeah, that part of the that part of it was was set in stone for sure. So, Mindhunter. I, I hope people have seen Mindhunter, but if people haven't, um, it's a you know it, it's a slow burn procedural most of the time. It's very talky. There are a lot of conference scenes, a lot of prison kinds of across the you know the the barrier scenes. Um, it has a lot of institutional spaces like prisons or the FBI or uh, one of my favorites is the weird Atlanta liaison office in season <laughs> two, um, which looks like it's in a converted, you know, community center. Um, but, and, and the domestic scenes are almost all super downscale uh, or at least mm -hmm. really ordinary. Um, for those of you who have seen Mank, and I hope all of you have, this is the opposite, right? We're talking about maximum glamour, tremendously interesting institutional spaces uh, and so on. Can you talk a little bit about making that shift before we get to even the black and white from shooting like what are gonna be, you know, sort of really demotic, ordinary, everybody around a table scenes to, well, okay, there's table scenes in Mank, but they have 50 yeah. people at them, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for saying that. I. I I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's script dependent. You know, you look at the story, you look at what the film is and you try to figure out what the film you, what the, what film you want to make. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, certainly with my work with David, you know, we look at it strictly from the point of view of, okay, what is the story we're telling? How do we want to tell that story? And, and what do we need to do with the camera to tell that story? It, you know, in the case of Mindhunter, it was, uh, it was, you know, it's the seventies. It had to have the color palette of the seventies. It had the pacing of a procedural conversation, you know, two people across the table from each other. Um, and, and, and the, the, the slow and steady kind of revealing of information to the audience. And, and so we told the story in a very kind of 
rhythmic way, I think. And, and, you know, it's basically script dependent. Um, and Mank, you know, has some different, obviously some significant stylistic differences, but it's, it's still, we are, we're using the camera to reveal information to the audience and, and forecast information and, 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 um, and bring the audience to a play. So, you know, I, I guess, I, I mean, the, the immediate differences are obvious to the audience, of course. I mean, certainly the palette and black and white and the, you know, the, the period, but the, um, uh, the way we use the camera is in a lot of ways, a little, you know, I, I think it's similar, you know, I mean, we're using different lenses, I guess. And, and, and the cutting pattern is different. You know, the, the, the pacing of the staging and the blocking is different, but, but uh, in the end, we're, you know, we're, we're assembling sequences basically, you know, we're looking at how the scenes, how the scenes block in 3d space and figuring out um, how we're going to translate that to the 2d image, you know? Uh, so, you know, it's the same thing we would do on any film. It's just it's sort of like, you have to look at it in context of what's, go what's going on on the page. Does but, that make sense? But it's also, no, no, it does, uh, but it's yeah. also still in 2-2. Um, it is. You know, uh, it, you know, there, there are a lot of movies that when they want to cast back to a kind of black and white past would go for an Academy ratio kind of sure. uh, constraint. Um, and uh, I, I promise we're going to talk about the black and white a lot, but what, when did you know that you really wanted to stay with the two, two, or was that a, a Netflix well, requirement? Or we talked about it, you know, I mean, there was, there was a conversation it wasn't a long conversation, but we did talk about, well, maybe we can do this in four, three or one, you know, one, three, six to one. And, and, and that was, you know, there was a, there was a, throughout the making of the film, at least in the, in the production of the film, it was, a, it was a conversation about, okay, well, how far do we want to go with uh, staying technically true to the period? Uh, and, and how much modernism do we want to bring into it? And, and it's, you know, look, it's like, uh, there's an argument to be made like, okay, we could have gotten, a, you know, uh, BNCR and we could have gotten 35 millimeter film and we could have, you know, got a bunch of arc lights and it's a slippery slope, you know? We, um, and, and in the end it was sort of like, well, this is the way we want to tell the story. And, and the aspect ratio I think is, 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 it really affects the way you stage That's and cool. it affects the way you block a scene and it affects the way you build the sets. And uh, we wanted to work in depth. We wanted to work in, um, and we wanted to tell the story in overs and we wanted to tell, mm. tell the story in perspective. And, um, you know, it's four by three or, or one, three, seven or one, three, six, or however you want, you know, they, they, they work, it works great in a close up and it works great in a two shot. And it's very difficult to frame overs with depth. And it's very difficult to frame, you know, wide shots with, with perspective um, compared to 2.2 to one or two, three, you know, two, three, five or two, four, Oh, or, or even one, eight, five, you know, it's, um, yeah. and, and yeah, I, I of, suspect, yeah. pardon? I was just gonna say none of those scenes at San Simeon with everybody at dinner are carry that weight uh, in, in an academy shot exactly yeah i mean i mean that's actually that's an excellent point because it, that's really where the decision came was david and i were looking at the this long you know kind of dracula's castle dinner table and it's like how would we possibly tell the story in in you know academy square frame and it just didn't feel right it was like i don't know we don't want to make the movie this way and right. um you know, I get, I get the criticism of like, oh, you know, it's like, it's like here, like where I'm framed in this, in this doorway here, you know, it's like, it's a different frame if it's, you know what I mean? It's just, it's a different film and it's just not the film we really wanted to make. So we, um, so, so we deviated there and I'm glad we did it because it, 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 it freed us up. And I think, you know, there's probably an argument to be made that maybe if Greg Toland and, and, um, and Orson Welles had had the opportunity to shoot in Super 35 and crop and uh, they, they may have done it as well. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's a nice thing to, you know, it's, it's a nice format to work in. I'll say that. It was yeah. something we had grown quite accustomed to. Well, uh, I mean, you know, Netflix also, you know, got other side of the wind finished and distributed and that has whatever, a dozen sure. kinds of stock in it and all sorts of aspect jumping uh, and so on. All right. 
for sure. I promised we would talk about black and white. It's okay. We definitely want to talk about black and white. You had been working in this 70s palette and then you're, you know, off shooting, you know, with Ridley Scott and that's the kind of rich colored, you know, bluish world. Uh, <laughs> totally, yeah. He's, you know, um, and then now you're in black and white and not only shooting in black and white, but shooting a movie about a movie that has legendary black and white cinematography in it. Um, and so what did you feel you needed to do to get ready to make that shift? Um, and I'll have some follow-ups, I bet. Well, I, sure. Um, I, well, I was a little naive, to be honest. Like, I initially, I was like, oh, cool, I'll, I'll do this. Like, I get to do this noir black and white movie. And and you know, I think cinematographers are seduced by it. And you're like, oh, I get to do all this, like, heavy shape and chiaroscuro. And I can really, like, lean into it. And I get to be stylized more than I used to be. And then I read the script more closely. And I realized, like, that's not really this film. It doesn't, it would not, it would feel forced. If I really laid into it, you know. Um, and I got, uh, I, I started to get a little insecure about the idea of it becoming parody. Mm. And what is that line? Like, how do you ride the line? Because you want the audience to get transported, but you don't want to draw too much attention to the fact that they're watching a black and white film. I mean, the hope is that they watch the movie in the first five minutes. They're like, oh, cool, it's a black and white film. And then they forget about it, right? That's the hope anyway. Um, I don't know if we've succeeded, but that's the hope. But it's, so, I kind of went back to the drawing board and we watched a lot of movies. And normally it's like, okay, painting and fine art photography and, and film and, you know, and, you know, it's like you sort of start to assemble it. And this, in the case of this movie, it was all films. And it was like, let's look at films. And- um, But what'd you look at? I, I'm sure the audience wants to know. Sure, I mean, you know, it was like, I mean, obviously we looked at Citizen Kane, um, but, you know, Citizen Kane has, uh, St structurally it's similar to Mank in terms of the way the story is told with flashbacks, but in terms of locations, it's very different. You know, it's like Citizen Kane is all in these cavernous environments, you know, the Thatcher library and the office, and it's all in these like, in and you know, in San Simeon, it's in these enclosed spaces. Um, and Mank is not, you know, Mank is on a studio lot and it's at the beach and we're in the, you know, we're in the desert for half the film and, and, and we're, and, and it's, uh, you know, we're out in the, in the fields of San Simeon uh, where we meet Marion Davies for the first time. It's a very different movie location wise than Citizen Kane. So it didn't, so Citizen Kane in actuality didn't have a lot of correlation to the way the movie probably should look because the spaces are so different. Um, but I looked at other Greg Tolan work. I mean, you know, it's, I, we looked at uh, Grapes of Wrath, I think it was a, was a good reference, uh, certainly for the desert stuff. Um, Rebecca, we'll watch Rebecca. Um, Night of the Hunter is like an old favorite of mine. I, you know, I love it. Um, uh, um, you know, and more modern films too, you know, uh, In Cold Blood and Manhattan. And, you know, there was there's elements of the film that, you know, where it, it actually felt appropriate to bring a little bit of modernism into it. So there's, you know, there's parts of our film that, that are lit kind of soft and they're lit with, with slightly more modern techniques. And you go into the flashbacks and they're lit with more texture and shape. And it's sort of an idea, you know, the idea was like, how do we differentiate time? And can we do it that way? It's pretty subtle, but we tried. Uh, yeah. No, I think that, that like, you know, for example, the scenes, uh, but particularly the pivotal scenes um, with Thalberg in his office, uh, with the hard Venetian blind slant, um, you know that's a double indemnity shot in some ways. Like it's you know, sure. planometric, it's centered, it's lovely, yeah. and that says thirty as opposed to the filtered light of the desert in Victorville or whatever. Right? Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I, yeah, I, I mean it's you know it's funny. It's like the you know the spectrum of black and white photography, at least cinema photography, is so wide and it's much wider than people give it credit for. You know, you have the glamour of the early 30s and then you have, you know, all the way to the deep noir of the mid 40s. And, and you look at those movies against each other and they are they're dramatically different. And, and unfortunately, in today's cinema, you know, e even the educated uh, 
movie going public is still kind of, I think they equate it in a much more truncated realm of what black and white film is, you know, and it's like the big combo and Casablanca and it's like, okay, that's what black and white cinema is. But in reality, it's, it's a huge spectrum. Huge. And, and, yeah. you know, and I, I think that one of the, you know, that, that uh, all about Eve, Joe Mankiewicz's sort of mm -hmm. grand film is a much, you know, a much softer black and white most sure. way through it. For um, sure. For sure. So uh, those are some of the historical examples. I was trying to think of some recent films that like you would have been bouncing off of or running away from. Um, and because it was a Fincher film, I was thinking about Soderbergh because they go back and forth. And clearly The Good German was a movie you all didn't want to make. That is like, you didn't want to use <laughs> the BNR and the old lenses and the old arc lights um, and the aspect ratio and all of that. But the because it was a, a Netflix film, probably the you know the the big Netflix black and white film that I think of around that time would be would be Roma. Um, sure. Can you talk a little bit about like I guess the sort of Scylla and Charybdis of those like not wanting to do either of them and how you imagined like your work, you know? For, I, well, for I mean, first of all, I really admire Roma. I think it's stunning and I think it's beautiful. And um, but it, I don't. I don't think we looked at anything and we were like, we're not going to make this. I, I think yeah. it was more like, um, I mean, I think Roma, Roma is a film that has, it really centers for, definitely on naturalism and it feels very, you know, it feels very appropriate for what it is. Um, our film starts in realism i'm not sure natural you know there's sort of difference between realism and naturalism i don't know how to articulate that but it's sort of it always start we always started from a place of okay what is this environment and then what is the filigree we add to it mm -hmm. uh you know it, just in terms of a little bit of spice and and it was like lean like leaning into the style a little bit but trying not to detract from what's happening on screen and um you know, our, our film is still ostensibly told in cuts. I mean, it's shots and reverse shots and sequencing and timing and, you know, and it's about, it's about, about wit and it's about, uh, uh, you know, the character development is, is told in the process of these, of, of these sequences. You know, a film like Roma is, 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 a, is a different animal in terms of how it's, how it's structured, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, when I look at Roma, what I think is really fantastic about it is you have these kind of sweeping one or shots that are where the shots are developing over this period. And it really affects the pace of the film and how you take. But it's very appropriate for this. You know, we can't we could never have told Mank that way because the script isn't written that way. So it's you know, they're very different films, you know, in their DNA. Um, you know, the, well, it's, it's just the fact that they're black and white. It's sort of like it's, you know, it's like comparing two color films and saying, oh, well, this one's this way. It's like. You know what I mean? It's like, I, 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 it's a, they're very different animals, you know? Uh, yeah. That's what I wanted to hear you talk a little yeah, bit about was because sure. we'll talk more about some of the ways in which cinematography interacts with other crafts and other parts of the process. But we often think of sort of, you know, the editor as the, you know, it, like the, if the creative triangle is director, cinematographer, production designer, then the editor is sort of dropping in later. And so in something like Roma, where there are these long oneers, the edit is just when everything is done. But in your sequences, in the way this movie is told, there's enormous punctuation at the end of each sequence. You know, there's usually a fade to black, uh, often with a bright white light held in the middle. Um, there's often, you know, one of those, you know, a, a screenplay announcement at the beginning of a new sequence. There's usually a sound signal like we had in Citizen Kane of the shift in location and time. Um, I mean, hell, there are cigarette burns for the, mm -hmm. you know, for the real changes. Like it's, it's punctuated. Um, sure. And I, I wanted to hear a little bit more about, uh, about that, about in fact, shooting for the cut. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, well, I think, I really feel strongly that that cinematography has has I I, like, I feel very connected to the editor, <laughs> you know, like this, like I think, you know, the, you know, cinematography is is we are we are often disproportionately credited for the way the movie looks, you know, it's like 
oh, they, like, you know, and you get all this credit for the way the movie looks. And when in actuality, the costume designer and the production designer, you share that responsibility with them, you know, and you have a part to play. Obviously, a big part as a cinematographer in, in, in how the movie looks, certainly with, you know, how you choose your film stock or if you're shooting digitally, how you're treating the digital camera and what lenses and all, all that stuff happens. But but really what we're doing on the set anyway, and certainly like when I'm working with David, what, what we're doing is we're like, we're taking this three-dimensional story of actors in space and we're converting it to two dimensions. And then we're thinking about how those things are gonna cut together to tell the story and, and, and be sequenced. Um, that is ostensibly editing. It's just, we're, you know, and so we're thinking about different options and, and, and how those things may be, may be assembled and you're thinking about okay well it could be cut this way or could cut this way and we got to make sure that they have the opportunity because if they have to accelerate the edit they need a place to go and you're like you know you're sort of thinking about how to protect the edit in a way and then um you know i mean not to take anything away from editing because we you know we just dump all this footage on on in this yeah. case on kirk baxter who then gets to distill it down and he's like okay this works with this and this works with this but it's because it's done with intent you know we've sort of looked at it and um i'm i mean i'm just personally I'm much more interested in that part of the process than I am in like which light goes where I mean that all those conversations are reflexive it's like okay well the actors are here and we want this in the background and we need this window to be lit and she has to go there because she has to pick up this prop and walk over there so the camera has to be here etc that informs all the lighting choices it's like it's not the other way around you know so um so is so a lot of the way the movie ends up looking is dictated by the process by which you have to tell the story. Does that does that make sense? I yeah. It makes a lot of sense, but one of the things that it 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 brings to mind is the amount of like if if the illusion of of a film like Roma is that people are just acting in front of a camera and eventually somebody turns it off. And uh, the illusion of a film like this that everything is scripted in advance uh which it's, you know, it's not, there's obviously stuff that happens on the day. One of the things that it highlights is uh, a kind of skill that we probably used to think of as a TV skill um, of being able to plan in advance around a repertoire that wouldn't look boring and stultified and so on. And in that sense, like your career uh, at this moment, it does the sort of Jack Russell thing of going from shooting, you know, Alfred Hitchcock Presents to jumping over to shoot Psycho, um, uh, you know, right at the time when Hitchcock goes from making those enormous hyper-colored, you know, features like Vertigo, to working with his TV crew, albeit like on, um, you know, returning to black and white for him. Um, sure. So that that was just a compliment. Um, <laughs> you're, very kind. Russell, you're, too, you're far too kind. <laughs> but, but Jack Russell also, interestingly enough, then like goes on to be the camera operator for touch of evil so like he's one of the few people who worked you know or had been the camera operator in touch of evil he's one of the few people who worked with hitchcock and wells right at that you know sure. that crucial juncture anyway sure. um so let's talk about some other parts of the process that you were working with you mentioned costume and production design you all knew you were shooting in black and white uh it wasn't going to be converted what all did you have to make sure that you did going in were there any interesting like conversations in that lead up uh, to, you know, getting on set. Yeah. Well, and there was, God, there were weeks of it. I mean, we, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, the thing about it, the thing about black and white is, is two shades of red, depending on what color light hits them can appear very different on camera. And we were very cautious about cautious and conscious of those subtleties. And, and, you know, particularly when you're putting, putting someone in a gray suit against the blue background. Uh, if, if you don't do it right, they, 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 there's no color separation, you know, to, to take advantage of them. I mean, you, they can blend right in. And, and so Trish Somerville and I, and Don Bird and I did tens of tests and we went, we shot stuff with the iPhones in black and white mode. And we figured out what the variances were between that and, the, and our camera. And then we shot lots of tests with our camera. And, I mean, hundreds, we, you know, we put the actors in front, in front of seamlesses and we lit them from 15 different directions. And we had, you know, had Gary stand there and like, you know, look this way and then look this way and then look this way. And we changed the lighting and he does, you know, repeatedly over and over and over again. And then we went back at it like, well, this works with this, that, this background and this hairstyle and this makeup. And, you know, it's, it's, it was exhaustive, but it, 
it, it, we learned a tremendous amount in that process because it was not the kind of thing where we could just say, oh, that'll work or that'll work without work without testing. I mean, Don and I, we did, there's a scene in the movie, in the beginning of the movie where, where Charlie Letterer goes and meets Joe Mankiewicz in the bathroom. And, 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 you know, Don is very, he does tons of research and he was like, okay, well at Paramount, the, the bathrooms are, they had green tile and that tile hasn't changed. And so we, we should do green tile, but let's test. You know, we had like 40 little green tiles. We put them in front of the camera and figured out which tone we liked relative to Joe Mankiewicz's brown suit, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it was, you know, it was, I, I think when we first realized the, the kind of intensity of that situation, it, would, it all, it scared us all a little bit. Uh, and then we just dug in and we figured it out and, you know, we'd sent stuff to David and we're like, what do you think about this with this, with this, with, with this? And, you know, the permutations get big and, um, but we did a lot of work on our own. You know, I spent more time in Don Burt's office than I did in mine. I mean, I was just, I was in his office all day long. So, so about how much time had you been, were you allowed to, to do that? Because obviously in a, you know, in a, at RKO, you know, the, the back in the day, the camera department would have had, you know, a couple of days, maybe a week with <laughs> yeah. the production design team. Uh, one of the things that, you know, makes, the Mercury Theater makes Wells so interesting is that he sort of radically expands the amount of pre-production time um, in order to get what he wants. Sure. You guys presumably had more than a week, but you, I bet there was still a We clock did, ticking. yeah, we were fortunate. I mean, you know, to, to, to their credit, they, they were much more experienced shooting black and white than we ever were. Uh, but, um, I, you know, I think, I think I had six weeks prep or eight weeks prep on the movie. I can't remember. It was, it was you know, it was, it was short. I, you know, they, I came back from, from Africa on, on wolves and I had I, the next, I, on a sat, I flew in Saturday and on Monday I started on Mac. Can we just hit the ground running? We, David and I immediately scouted and we looked at stuff and he had, you know, he had picked most of the locations by the time I got there. So uh, we made some changes. There were some stuff, stuff, some stuff that me initially was meant to be on location. And we switched to stage because we needed some lighting freedom that we, we wouldn't have on location, things like that. But, um, I mean, most of the testing I did was actually lenses. We, you know, I did mm -hmm. several weeks of lens tests before we kind of settled on where, what the, what the recipe was going to be. Um, and, but it was all kind of happening simultaneously. You know, we were doing lens tests while we were doing color tests and we were, you know, it was like, we were doing, you know, we were working on the grade everything was sort of inter, you know, intertwined. Cause there, there are certainly some moments that give us that what I want to call it sort of like old school, it's not even a lens flare, but just sort of the old school reflections inside the lens. You know, uh, I'm thinking maybe about uh, when Upton Sinclair is speaking and we get those, the the sort of <laughs> ring reflections from yeah. the arc lights. Uh -huh. um, can you talk a little bit about, because those are moments when it really, does, that's when it feels like 30s, 40s authentic, uh, you know, like, like Hallmark authenticity. Um, oh, good. Yeah. Uh, Thank okay. you. Yeah. Okay. That's all you wanted is that you just wanted it to be that way. That's great. Yeah, that was, yeah. I mean, you know, we had done on Mindhunter, we, David and I had done a lot of painted flares, you know, oh. we had, we had painted flares in digitally because modern lenses are really difficult to flare actually, you know, they're, they've all been designed. All of that has been designed out of them. I mean, you know, the coatings are really good. The quality of the glass is extremely good there they're almost clinical modern lenses. And, and that's great if you want resolution, which is something we did want. Um, but they're difficult to get, they're difficult to flare. And when, and, and if you, you know, if you shoot vintage lenses, they flare almost with anything and it's very difficult to predict how they're going to flare. So it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a crapshoot. And and we had done a lot of that on Mindhunter. We had done these sort of anamorphic style flares, which is not what we wanted for Mank, but it was, you know, something we had played with and had a lot of success with. And when in, in part of the prep process on this film, I had seen some flares actually in the big combo, uh -huh. um, which is a very distinct 40s thing. And it's this ring that you get around highlights. It's this very defined halo, um, which, uh, simple lenses uh, do, and you know, sort of modern lenses with these compound groups of glass. They 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 they've eliminated that, but it was an artifact that that I thought was like spectacular. I was like, we should really try and do this. And I sent a bunch of sample frames to 
to David and the post department on Mank, and I said, what do you guys think of this? And then they, uh, they took that to the visual effects people and they're like, well, you know, they experimented and they sent us like 15 different versions of how that might work. And, That's... and it, it was so cool. I mean, we got yeah. to, we got to art direct. It's like, make that ring a little bigger and make that diffract a little more, you know, and we really kind of got into it. So, it, so the, you know, the, the, the secret of course, is that none of that happened on the set that all happened in post, but it was all from the intent of, from the very beginning, we're like, we want it to look like this. Uh, because it's it's next to impossible to get it to actually happen, you know, uh, at least in a way that's predictable that you want uh, to happen. You know, there's plenty of unhappy accidents to be had, but uh, you know, the, the the happy accidents unfortunately are few and far between. If people want to see a great example of that, the opening of Crack Up, an old Pat O'Brien film, um, has a train coming at us, uh, and it's got just like endless ring. Uh, flares uh, going on. So you mentioned they're sending it to the VFX department. The other VFX question I had was mainly about when um, uh, Marion and Mank are taking their night walk uh, around San Simeon and they're walking by all the menagerie mm -hmm. and uh, presumably you're leaving space for the elephants and the giraffes uh, and the monkeys, I'm guessing. I, uh, in, in, in they're, Citizen they're Kane, all real. We we ship them in. They're all real. <laughs> right. I was gonna say in Citizen Kane, Toland would have just done that with mats, right? Like right. You know, there's a million mat shots in Citizen Kane that like nobody admitted to for a long time. But you all are presumably doing it, uh, leaving space. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Because that's obviously you know state of the art kind of effect. Yeah, right? I mean I. I think ILM did that stuff. I can't remember, but I, I think okay. they did it and they're the best, you know? Um, but we did, yeah, you, you know, we, that's, that's, that entire sequence is shot day for night. I'm not sure if you knew that. Um, I, I but, didn't, but. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, that's great. That fills me with joy. <laughs> I figured it was magic hour or later. Yeah, but that's great. No, it's yeah. All, yeah, no, it's, it was all done day for night. And, and because of that, we had gone and prepped it a lot. I mean, there's probably, mm -hmm. I, that's the sequence we spent the most time in prep on and figuring out which shots needed to be done at which time when the sun was there. And, you know, because we, in order for day for night really to work, it, uh, it, it at least for the, what the look we were going for, it had to be either backlit or side lit, you know, so it, it, and it very much has to do with where the sun is. So we had, we had gone and we had you know, pretty extensively pre-visualized it, at least in, pre, you know, we didn't computer pre-visualize it, but we went in and we, we figured out where the camera was going to be and where it was going to go and where the elephants would be in the background, you know, when they're in that, in that kind of um, labyrinth garden and they're walking, we reveal the, you know, we knew that they would be there and we would look over their shoulder and we'd pull focus to them when they, when they look, when we're in that two shot behind, you know, it was all quite planned. Um, yeah. You know, the monkey cage was a, uh, you know, you can't shoot blue screen, obviously, uh, on the black and white camera. So what we did is we built a, we built theatrical flats, the shape of the mon monkey cage painted white, and then we lit them, and the post guys pil pulled a luminance key, and that's how we separated them and, and put the monkey cage in. Uh, but the elephants are, you know, they're rotoscoped, or it's, pardon me, the, the giraffes are rotoscoped, and they're put in the background there. And, um, yeah, but it, it's, it was, you know, it was, it was heavily planned, for sure. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think one of the things I like about this movie is that like it feels super consistent in the ways that it's like looking the way it wants to look. But in order to do that, sometimes it has to get very old fashioned, uh, you know, like painting white theater flats. And sometimes it has to get super state of the art in order to get the VFX to work. And sometimes it's just like, in some ways, reinventing pieces of old school black and white cinematography to make sure that you know how, as you were saying, you know, how this green looks in black and white, how that green looks in black and white. And that whole range uh, of skills is obviously on display is one of the things uh, that I was struck by. So one of the other things that people have certainly talked a bunch about, um, and I think in part because the performances are so good, uh, is the age gap between Gary Oldman and either Amanda uh, Seyfried or Tuppence. Um, were there moments where you were like, my problem right now is figure out how to light these two so they look the same age? Uh, or did you have to like make allowances for that? Is that like, 
were you dumping front light in order to sort of like try to make them be roughly chronologically the same age or no? No, I mean, you know, no, not really. I mean, I think, you know, it didn't occur to me until I, until the scene where, where Gary says I'm 44, but thanks, you know, at the end of the film, because if you look at photographs of Herman Mankiewicz from the time, he looks about the age of Gary. You know, they look. Oh yeah, he looks similar. really used up. You yeah. know, and 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 look, it's no secret Henry Mankiewicz lived a hard life. You yeah. know, um, he lived a very hard life, and um, and it wore on him. And that's part of what the movie is about. You know, so I think, um, you know, you I, I, I look. I'm not a director, but I, I think you cast you cast the actors you think can tell can can play the play the role. And you know, I think Gary can clearly play play the role. Um, his current age, in my opinion, is sort of irrelevant. You know, it's like, um, you know, when, when in, in the flashback scene, which is where he's meant to be earlier, his hair is, you know, is better done and he's better dressed and he's not so ragged and he's clean shaven. And, you know, um, I think actually, if you, if you look at the, at the images of, of Mankiewicz, you know, the sort of studio portraits and stuff, he looks like Gary in the movie. Um, you know, and Amanda, uh, I mean, I can't, at the moment, I can't think of any, any other actor that could have played Marion Davies, you know, after seeing Amanda oh, in the movie. So it's sort of like, you know, I mean, we lit her, you know, she's lit. That's one place certainly where we leaned into the glamour light because it felt yeah. appropriate. You know, it was right. like this sort of thing, you know, certainly in that last scene in the, di in, in the, in the dining room, it was like, okay, we can really, we can really kind of lean into that here. Um, and a little bit of that is, you know, it's tongue in cheek and a little bit of fun, you know, sort of like this is this is the period. But it also, you know, it's meant to be this scene where he's orbiting around. I mean, he's talking to 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 Hearst, but he's really orbiting around Marion. So she's kind of the beacon in the center of the scene, you know. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and, yeah, yeah, I don't know. It didn't that that never occurred to me until until, you know, some of the criticism came out and they're like, oh, the, the age difference I was like, God, I didn't even think, of, you know, it just didn't even occur to, to, you know, certainly not to me when we were making a movie. Well, but also like, but you've just explained why they would not only like look different at the time, but why you would want them to look different, you know, to the audience because you're, you know, if she's going to carry that valence of Hollywood glamour and he's going to carry, you know, the scars of a life of, you know, serious alcoholism, like they're going to look very different. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, for sure. There is a, there, there are a couple of, a couple of quick things and I'll get it open to the Q and a one is there are some shots of them at, uh, at San Simeon uh, where he's clearly looking at her and they're, you know, they're sort of flirting with each other in that great conversation. Um, that are shot like split diopter shots with him. You know, those seem like very florid, like Greg Toland uh, deep focus shots with just the edge of Gary's face, uh -huh. but totally in focus and her 30 feet away, totally in focus. Um, those aren't split diopters, so it didn't look like. What did you, no. how, how'd you get them? Did you just digitally do it or? No, no, that is just legit deep focus photography. That there is, we go. That's just math. No, I mean, we, we just, we figured nice. out where the hyperfocal needed to be. I mean, the, you know, the lens is, is, is at a very deep stop. I mean, we're at an 11 or in, in some cases, probably the shot you're look, you're talking about the mayor birthday party scene where, where, where yeah. the camera's over his shoulder and it's very close to his cheek and she's in the background with the sofa, that shot. Yeah. Yeah. I think we shot that at a 16, I think. Um, and it's probably oh, okay. a 40 or a 35. I mean, it's a relatively long lens to do that in. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's just there's, you know, there's a fair amount of light on the set and it's it's shot at an incredibly deep stop. Um, and that's how, you know, we shot most of the movie that way, by the way. I mean, almost the entire film, I think I was at an 11. Uh, oh, wow. So it's, yeah, it's, you know, it's specifically for that purpose. Uh, yeah, it's it's yeah. totally effective, but it's one of those places where the 40s and the 70s look sort of merge because in, you know, be, because the, the Toland lenses tended to be very short. And so- right when you had two things in focus of those radically different depths, you got wild distortion in whoever was close to the lens. Uh, and here, Gary looks great, she looks great, and they're really far yeah. apart. 
<laughs> yeah, um, it was fun. Yeah, I mean, I hadn't done that before. It was really interesting to play. You know, I don't. I think it would look terrible in color. By the way, it's like it only works in black and white for some reason. Yeah. And then the other thing is, this has the uh, the Netflix uh, high dynamic range credit uh, at the opening. Um, this is now your second sort of major, you know, Netflix project. Can you talk about working in high dynamic range? Because I know that like some people sometimes chafe at that. Sometimes people are like it's not a big deal. It's just what the what I shoot in the you know shoot on the reds. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. I mean, it's I I, I love it. To be honest, I, I've grown incredibly fond of it. I mean, I love I love the uh, the expanded range. I love to play with it. Um, from from a story point of view, you know, you can play a window really hot. You can you know you can play an explosion really hot. You can really affect the audience, particularly in the theater. I mean, there are very few theaters where you can go see anything in in true high dynamic range now. But but it will you know it will come in. But but certainly in the home. Uh, I love the opportunity to play with that. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's a bit misunderstood to be honest. I mean, people who have not embraced it and are trying, you know, it's, it gets a little esoteric. So stop me if it gets boring, but you sort of like it, I sort of equate, you know, shooting an SDR and finishing an HDR is like shooting on film, but exposing it on the video tap. You know? You know, you, 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 you are, you're only looking at this little narrow band of the camera when in fact the camera has all this range. And um, so why not look at it with all that range and why not display all this range? And, you know, you can still use it selectively in the grading process. You can say, okay, I want this to blow out and I want to control the contrast here, et cetera. Um, but, but for me, it's been a, it's been a completely life-changing situation. I mean, at least it, it's been, a, uh, it's completely revolutionized the way I work. And actually it's, it's, it's created a situation where I've used a lot less fill light than I used to use. I've, I've had, I've had to protect the highlights less because I really know where the exposure is. I'm very comfortable exposing the camera. And, um, so now even when I do an SDR finished job, I mean, this movie I'm on right now is a theatrical, is, isn't, is destined for a theatrical release. We're going to monitor an HDR because I feel so much more confident in terms of how I can expose the camera when I'm doing that. So it's, it's completely changed the way it works. Wow. That's that's a terrific answer. I don't think that's boring at all. Like if somebody okay. says, <laughs> if somebody says, I came along and this particular format that we moved to has changed the way I work as a DP. Uh, if somebody showed up to this Q and A, they wanted to know that. Like I don't think that's boring. Um, okay, good. All right, I want to uh, open up some of the uh, the Q and A stuff um, here. Uh, let's see if I can, how I can do that. So the first question, actually, the first question we answered already was about color palette. Um, for a film that'll be shot in black and white. Um, um, let's see. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, um, let's see if we can. Uh, let's, oh, there's some questions about filters. Um, uh, let me see if I can get this one uh, popped up. This is going to be from um, uh, Simon Doherty. This is this is a pretty nerdy question, but it's uh, pretty great. Oh, sorry, it's from Joe Brady. Oh, maybe I didn't do that right. Um, oh, shoot, I, I managed to lose the question entirely. All right, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, so can we talk, there's a question here from uh, Tamara uh, Aguilar, uh, which is about blocking um, uh -huh. and whether there were unique blocking requirements uh, for this, and maybe one way to think about that to make that easy to talk about would be to compare to Mindhunter since the aspect ratios are the same. So in effect, the frame size is the same, but were there differences in how you were blocking for the light or blocking as a result of the um, changes? Or... No, not for the light. I think there's, you know, the film is, the, the pacing of the dialogue is much different. You know, the Mindhunter, mm -hmm. And certainly, you know, I think modern cinema is very much, it's, you know, it's call response storytelling. Um, uh, you know, acting of, of this period is, is, is much more theatrical in a way, you know, you look at, you know, even a film like Casablanca, which is relatively modern, I think, in terms of its storytelling, like it's kind of predated or it, you know, it's, it was, it was ahead of its time um, is are, uh, there, there are these moments of sort of, 
quantification or kind of, you know, this kind of these, you know, the actors are on screen much longer than they, than they would yeah. in modern cinema, I guess is the best way to articulate it. Um, so, so we, you know, we, I mean, I don't know. I think, I think it's probably, I think the, the staging of this film is probably slightly more modern than maybe films of the forties because we are, we are telling the story somewhat in a modern way. I mean, it's, you know, if you, you know, you look at like Maltese Falcon, for example, it's, you know, you hold on these two shots for two minutes, you know, in many cases. Um, I'm not sure the modern audience is quite prepared for that. So there's sort of, you know, there, there are certainly elements of that of like, well, what if you're over here and we cut to, you know, this sort of like back and forth, we are doing that to a degree. Um, that has nothing to do with the fact that it's black and white. I mean, it has everything to do with the way the script is, is pulled and how the actors want to stage it, et cetera, I think, you know, um, and how David obviously wants to stage it. Uh, there are, certainly lighting considerations that are different because it's in black and white because we don't have color separation to explain depth so we're you know i'm using i'm using shape and texture and, and contrast to to describe and composition to describe depth and you know in ways that you normally could use color um and that has a lot to do with why the deep deep focus works by the way you know in, in color photography you can you can shoot super shallow focus because i could make the background blue if the face is orange and you can separate the, but you know, in, in black and white, if it's, if everything's black and white and it's soft lit and it, and I make the, the, the focus very shallow, it's very easy for that person to get lost in the background, you know? So, so there's those sorts of considerations to take, but, uh, but I, I, I wouldn't say that the staging is dictated by the black and white format. No. Well, cool. I was going to say that like, for me, the first sort of really modern black and white, sort of staging of directing is some of like the Alexander McKendrick films. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I just, I feel like th there's a kind of, you know, fluidity to where the actors are going to be that, and it particularly works well when you've got someone like Burt Lancaster who takes up an enormous amount of space. Um, <laughs> it works really well, I think with Gary Oldman, who, you know, here is taking up a little more space than usual, but also because he's he theatrically large um, yeah, for sure, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah cool i'm um, sorry so this was simon's question um and it I, i'm just going to read it so uh peter mavramatis recently recalled that when fincher was prepping mank way back in the 90s he wanted to achieve the look of east german orwo film stock 23 years on would you say that his aesthetic vision for the film had changed significantly due to the digital freedom we have now or would you attribute it to something else it definitely well, doesn't you know, look like I, an East German film. <laughs> I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't on the film then, so right. I, you know, my context is 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 limited. But um, there were certainly things that we referenced, and I, and and you know the sort of German expressionism, expressionism cinema of the thirties. You know, I mean. Uh, Caligari, you know, the kind of like that, that kind of bloomy softness that you get. Um, and, and, you know, and you get it in, in American film too, by the way, you know, this kind of like when you go through the dupe process and you get this softness in the blacks and you get this kind of, you know, the blacks bleed into the whites a little bit. That was something that David was quite specific that he wanted to figure out how to, how to achieve. And, and we spent a good portion of the prep working on that um, and exploring that. So, um, I mean, I, you know, the, the the wonderful thing about working with David is, 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 is the film is exactly how we wanted it to be. You know, there was no, there was no acceptance of failure. You know, there was no like, Oh, well, that's just what we ended up with. And we're going to put it on screen anyway. It's like, we, you know, we set out to achieve something very specific. We talked about it. We explored some options. We settled on a plan and we executed the plan. And that's what the movie is ostensibly, you know, um, so it's, uh, that is the movie I think we intended to make uh, uh, for better or worse. But, uh, you know, the grain structure we looked at and exposure range and those sorts of things. I mean, there's obviously uh, modern elements to it. And, you know, it's people ask me about film all the time and it's like, well, we wanted, you know, it's like, why didn't you shoot on film? And it's because we wanted a very, you know, we wanted to be incredibly specific about the way certain things looked. And it wasn't about accepting the, uh, 
accepting the realities of what we were going to get. We, we wanted to art direct every single aspect of the process, you know, um, and you could, you know, you can debate the merits of that all you want, but it was, it was, that was the thing we wanted to do. And, um, and so the, you know, the, the format that we chose allowed that to happen. Cool. Um, can you talk a little bit about working now that you're on set, uh, working in the COVID era? Um, <laughs> like, we hear a lot about what the changes are like. They're sort of depopulated sets. There's a lot more wait and see uh, and so on. Anything that's particularly struck you that you didn't anticipate? Um, I, you know, I think it, I, I thought it would be harder, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I think filmmakers are, they're survivors and they are intrepid and, and um, there's a lot of ingenuity and people are, you know, they, they are, they are tenacious. So um, I guess I should say we are tenacious, but yeah, you know, I, I think, um, you know, you figure out a way to make it work. I mean, there, you know, sure there's, you know, you have to limit your, your, your proximity to other people and you have to be considerate of how many people are on the set, of course. And, you know, the, the testing is, in, you know, really important and has, has proven to be incredibly helpful in, 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 uh, in mitigating some of those risks, I think. And, um, you know, I'm glad the studios have, have taken it as seriously as they have. Uh, I have, I, I am yet to feel creatively restricted, to be honest. Um, no, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to work on, on projects that, with, you know, with, with good budgets, but, uh, but uh, for the most part, I, I feel like, you know, uh, people are there, they want to be there and, and, and they're in safe situations and we've managed to get the work done that we need to get done. So, and, you know, and there's a lot of pluses to the process too. I mean, I can, you know, that one thing, at least in the United States has come is, is a little bit more attention towards the 10 hour day, which I, I think is from a humanitarian standpoint is a, is a positive change. So uh, I hope it sticks around, but, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I, you know, it's, it's been a challenge, but nothing we can't overcome. So one last question, sorry, that was Kyle's question. Uh, okay. One last question here. Um, uh, as we sort of wrap up, uh, we've all been locked in. We've all watched a lot of stuff we might never have watched. Uh, Larry Freed wants to know if there's anything that you've seen from the past year that has been for you a cinematography standout uh, or something else that just sort of, you know, blew the doors off the place as you were watching. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, you know, I just saw uh, two, two documentaries really kind of, kind of took me. I, and it's funny. It's like, oftentimes it's the documentaries that really take my breath away, I guess, but it was um, my octopus teacher. Uh, I was incredibly impressed by and, and the truffle hunters I just saw this weekend and I was, I was, um, blown away by so i i i can't recommend those two movies enough i think they're i think they're spectacular and I'm, I'm a little bit behind the curve with the narrative films you know a lot of the a lot of the films that are that are getting a lot of attention at the moment um are not yet available so uh i'm, right. I'm eagerly awaiting to see uh you know a good friend of mine darius wolski shot uh news of the world i'm excited to see that film I, i'm yet to see it but uh i haven't seen nomadland yet i'm excited to see that film so you know one night in Miami, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm yet to see. So I, 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 there's a lot of anticipated films that, that I'm sure are spectacular that I just haven't seen yet, but we'll see. Well, fingers, th fingers that's crossed. great. Cause it's always nice to end with an agenda of uh, yeah, more good stuff totally. to, to look <laughs> yeah. forward to. Yeah. Um, I think uh, that this is probably a good time for us to wrap up uh, based on timing and uh, where we are in the questions. Um, I will, uh, then I guess try to give a little bit of a wrap up. Sorry, I'm, I'm new to doing this for film at Lincoln Center. Um, but uh, I really want to thank them for hosting us. I, uh, I want to thank HBO uh, for making this financially possible. But most of all, I want to thank Eric for coming uh, and being as candid uh, and forthright and also clear uh, in the responses to the questions that I and many of you had. Uh, if I didn't get to a lot of your questions in large part, that was often because we had just talked about it when you asked it. Um, so that's been uh, really terrific. And I hope that you've all enjoyed this and I hope you all take a great, take advantage of the fact that this series will continue um, all through the consideration season and well beyond. Um, yeah, and uh, have a great rest of your evening and uh, hope you see something good soon. Take care. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks for having me, of course.